projectors warming up. Just like to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, again, I'm uh, Dr. Dan Hembury from the Par Department of Geological Sciences. Um, there we go. So tonight's movie is Journey to the Center of the Earth. Um, and primarily what this movie is about, it's about exploration. It's about coming up with some question, some problem, and going out into the world and trying to find an answer to that problem or that question. And that's a method that's fundamental to geology and to paleontology and really any aspect of, of science. Um, going out and actually exploring the world. Usually when um, people think about scientists, they think about people sitting in a lab somewhere, sealed off from the world, but that's really not it. You know, we need to go out and explore, we need to find out uh, uh, what kind of information the Earth can actually uh, uh, give us. So what I thought I'd do as, as part of my talk here is, is talk about this idea of exploration in geology uh, and paleontology and bring in aspects of my own research uh, over the last decade or so. Uh, so just to start off with, okay, if we think about geology, or at least the aspect of geology that I'm really interested in, it's interpreting Earth history. So how has the Earth changed through time? And these images here show the Earth at different intervals in time, 260 million years ago during the Permian, 120 million years ago in the Cretaceous, 35 million years ago in the Oligocene, and of course the Earth that we all know uh, today. And one thing that you learn from studying geology is the Earth is constantly in a state of change. The Earth that we know today is going to change. It's not something that we can, we can really alter in any way. The configuration of the planet will change in very significant ways given enough time. But the question that I'm usually asked in intro geology courses or similar classes is, how do we know uh, what the Earth looked like in times in the past? How do we know what sorts of environments uh, were present at different points, points in the planet? And the answer to that question is always, we go to these places. Okay, we travel to these different parts of the Earth today, and we study the rocks. Okay, we study the material that was deposited, was, that was produced at these different points in time. And these rocks tell us stories. They provide a picture of what the Earth was like at these different points in time, these different parts of the Earth. Uh, which can be in, could have been in very different, different places from, from today. So just some examples of, of uh, this kind of work. For example, if we wanted to learn about the Earth during the Jurassic period, okay, we can go to different places like Namibia and Africa. Uh, here we have beautiful exposures of interlayered basalts or solidified lava flows but also ancient soils, okay, preserved ancient landscapes that are in between these various lava flows. So if you want to learn about this point in time, you need to go out into the world. Okay, in, this in this particular case, we can assemble a team of people okay, various members of the Department of Geological Sciences here at OU uh, Beth Gerlasty Kordesh, uh, who is a sedimentologist, Alicia Stegall, a paleontologist, myself, I'm a sedimentologist who specializes in ancient soils and soil organisms, and then of course, a graduate student, okay, somebody who's, who's learning the field. So this is also a great opportunity to educate new scientists. Okay, so we can go to these areas and we can study these rocks and we can learn about these ancient environments firsthand by collecting the, the material. Uh, but of course, there are always interesting aspects of field work. In this particular trip, we were in, in Africa, so there are lots of various wildlife encounters, uh, which we also had in the field. Uh, here is one of the outcrops we were working on. This is towards sunset and there are baboons that are sitting on the outcrop at this point. 
And here are some baboons walking along this wall as we start to head out toward the outcrop in the morning. So there are interesting aspects to going out and exploring the world, not only geologically, but being able to encounter uh, wildlife, uh, being able to actually experience uh, global biodiversity. So here we've got some uh, a kudu hiding in, in some trees, a uh, rhinoceros walking in front of our cars or driving down a road. So these are some of the interesting things that can happen uh, while you're actually doing this work. And then taking a bit more of an extreme approach, uh, similar age deposits also occur in Antarctica. So geologists do go to Antarctica as well to study rocks to figure out what was happening on this continent at times in the years past. Because it wasn't always covered in ice. Okay, there are times where it was actually covered in forests. How do we know this? We go there, we study the rocks, and the rocks tell us the story. Uh, so I myself have not been to Antarctica. Uh, these are photographs courtesy of my wife, Alicia Stegall, who has been there. Um, it is an extreme place to work, obviously. Uh, they set up camps out in the middle of nowhere, uh, surrounded by ice. There's lots of nice rock exposures along the mountains where you can go and explore. And this sort of environment has its own special types of challenges, obviously. It's very, very cold. You need specialized gear. Just getting there requires military transport. Um, but there is a commitment to doing science in these sorts of, of conditions, in these sorts of environments. Again, to learning more about, about Earth history. And we can compare uh, these rocks to those that we may find in Africa. Again, they're about the same age. And we can compare the different environments at those different points in time. And that can help inform on those global, re global reconstructions that we make and that we present in papers and ultimately in textbooks. Uh, but leading more into, into my own research, uh, my, my interests lie with soils, with landscapes, terrestrial landscapes. So I'm interested in what's happening on landscapes in various environments. Uh, one kind of environment that I'm beginning research on is various tundra ecosystems uh, and studying soils that are developing in tundra environments. So here's a nice uh, uh, shot of in uh, Denali uh, National Park. This is Polychrome Pass, kind of overlooking the entire area. And there are wonderful soils that are developing in this, in this tundra setting. And so when we look at these landscapes, you know, most people would focus upon the great mountains in the background. But for my own interest, what I'm really interested in are these soils. Okay, what is actually happening below the surface in these soils? So again, how you learn uh, about these sorts of environments, how you gain new knowledge is actually going to these areas, exploring them, um, and discovering uh, new knowledge. So one of the really interesting aspects about these, these tundra ecosystems is that they support a large population of, of ground squirrels. So these, these soils, these landscapes, are riddled with burrow systems. So it's basically a, a very, uh, very loose soil. If you walk over it, parts of it kind of collapse as you walk because below this surface, are hundreds and hundreds of tunnels of these burrowing mammals. Okay, so here are the ground squirrels right here, one at the surface keeping watch, uh, one of their burrows right here in the, in the hillside. So my interest in this is what is the record of this? Uh, what is the, and what is the effect of these, of these animals upon the soil? What is their impact on the soil? How do they help controlling soil formation in these environments? And ultimately, how can we recognize uh, this kind of environment in the rock record? There are clearly tundra environments in the past, but how do we recognize them? But since these sorts of environments are relatively poorly studied in the modern, it's very difficult to make those sorts of interpretations about the past. And that's ultimately what these sorts of modern studies are about, 
collecting a body of, of information, a body of data that you can use to help interpret the rock record. Now how I got started in this, in this field, in geology, I uh, was working at a much less picturesque locality. Um, this is Kansas. This is a lonely road cut along a back highway in Kansas. It doesn't look like much, but you don't need to go to extreme locations to do this kind of work, to discover new things. Um, this small outcrop actually houses a very interesting story. And it houses an interesting story about a terrestrial landscape which existed 260 million years ago during the Permian. This landscape looked very different at this time. And what was really interesting about this, this outcrop that got me going in the field of geology and paleontology is a pond deposit which was present within this outcrop. So we have very fine grained muddy sediment. And within this pond deposit were literally hundreds of burrows. Okay, burrows that contained fossilized remains of small amphibians. So what these burrows were recording was the behavior, the life behavior of a large population of amphibians within this pond. And this really got me excited about, about this, this kind of study, that you could actually see an expression of behavior in the geologic record. And these layers of burrows actually uh, uh, corresponded to areas, to intervals where these ponds dried out. So you had standing water, you had a drought, the ponds dried out, and all the amphibians burrowed into that sediment. And here are some examples of those burrows that um, we got out of that lake deposit. So they have very interesting morphologies, and then these complete skeletons of those amphibians coiled up inside their burrows. Uh, basically, they made these burrows, and they died inside of them. And they were fossilized, and were able to extract them. Okay, so this is one of my major areas of interest uh, in paleontology is this study of behavior in the rock record. And I've also continued this research uh, looking at, at soils, uh, looking at uh, soils to the Eocene Oligocene transition. And this is work that I did in Colorado. So this is jumping way forward in time to about 32 million years ago. And again, you go to where the rocks are. You explore areas where you can find new rocks. And there are lots of rocks that are exposed here in northeastern Colorado. Now, this is not the Colorado Rockies. This is along uh, the border of Nebraska. But there are abundant rocks here exposing this very critical interval in Earth history. As they're transitioning from kind of more of a, uh, uh, a wet ecosystem to uh, more of a dry ecosystem. And again, science is about having questions trying to solve problems. And one of the problems that I was addressing here is what exactly do the paleosols in this one locality say about the change in climate across this span of time? I'm going from about 26 million years ago at the base of this section to about 32 million years ago at the top. So the standard interpretation which is basically goes with, with no real data at this one locality, is that you're going from a well-vegetated system at the base to drier conditions at the, at the top. But again, that's without any real data collection, without going to the field, exploring and, and discovering uh, what the rocks have to say. But at this locality, again, going out and, and examining the rocks, uh, what we found was Instead, at the, at the base, we had evidence of, uh, of soils that told us that we're actually looking at drier conditions. Okay, there are fossilized root traces within these, these preserved soils that are more similar to uh, grasses, so very sparse vegetation scattered about. Uh, there are um, trace fossils, preserved burrows of animals like beetles, of bees, that are uh, uh, digging holes in the soil, uh, principally for breeding purposes. So this is more indicative of a, of a drier kind of environment. As we move up to the top of the section, however, 
what we end up seeing are indications of more moisture. In, in this particular case, uh, much more extensive vegetation. So here the root traces are enormous and penetrating these soils and pointing towards a more forested kind of a system. So again, this example, actually going out to the field exploring a new area, we were able to find an isolated zone that had a different story. We saw a different kind of transition. Instead of going from wet to dry, it went from dry to wet. So we're able to improve our, our reconstructions of what the Earth was like during these different times in different places. And then one final example uh, of field research is uh, work I've just started doing in Bolivia uh, with some colleagues at Case Western. So these deposits are Miocene, so getting a little younger, 14 million years ago, trying to assess, assess the same kinds of questions. So what can preserved soils tell us about the climate in different parts of the world? In this particular case, there are lots of fossils of mammals that have been collected from these localities. But there's not a lot of information about what the climate was like from other, other uh, lines of evidence, particularly from the soils. So this is a pretty interesting trip. Uh, this was uh, to southern Bolivia, uh, the more arid region, required a good deal of travel to get there. And any field expedition has uh, obviously a, a collection of, of collaborators, as I was talking about before. So we had people from Case Western, people from Berkeley, people from Argentina, people from Bolivia. So this is really a, a collaborative effort of a lot of researchers. And that's, again, what science is all about, is bringing a lot of people together, bringing a lot of knowledge together uh, to solve problems. Um, and one, one thing that you'll see uh, pointed out in the, in the movie is out of the amount of resources the amount of preparation that's required for any kind of expedition. And this is, of course, no different uh, from this trip. We had several vehicles that were loaded with gear going out into the desert and studying these, these paleosols. So at this, at this location, uh, again, we're going out studying these paleosols. Uh, the other researchers were looking at the fossil mammals. And from the, the information that we, that we uh, uh, gained from this trip, we were able to reconstruct that these were indeed uh, uh, kind of a wetter climate, climate soils, so indications of high moisture content, uh, which provides some good background information for interpreting the life habits of the various mammals that are inhabiting this landscape. So just to close, Again, I want to uh, stress the importance of this kind of research in science. Again, science is not about sitting isolated in a laboratory somewhere. It's about going out and exploring. Um, and I think this is one of the, uh, a really important concept to, to communicate to people. Um, it's a good way of bringing people into science uh, to, to understand that it's, it's a fascinating field where you can actually go out, see the world. Um, and there's a it's a large world. There's a lot to explore. There's a lot to see. There's a lot to learn. So just by walking out across a landscape is a good way of gaining knowledge um, and increasing our understanding of how the Earth has changed through time. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, but that said, I, you know, I think uh, just a couple of closing comments. I think one thing that um, the professor said at the end that it, it was really kind of fundamental to how science works is that um, it builds on previous work. And I think that, that's what guides us. There are actually a number of scientists who are sitting uh, in the crowd. But I think that's just such a fundamental concept for, for everyone to, to take away and to, to build on. Actually, we have some graduate students here as well. But really, the work that we do really is so foundational based on what's happened uh, ahead of us. But with that, um, I guess if there are any questions that, that folks want to throw up to us, um, 
you know, I think Dan did a great job of talking about basic exploratory research, what kind of a role that has in, in society today. Um, but uh, yeah, let's, let's go. Any questions? What, what is my personal? Okay, so the question, and I've been asked to repeat questions. Uh, the question was, what is my research focus? So I'm, uh, I'm a biologist uh, who works on animals that are alive today, but I also spend quite a bit of my research time working in the fossil record, and specifically on backboned animals or vertebrates. Uh, and, and a lot of what I try and understand is the anatomy of uh, animals such as dinosaurs, birds, crocodiles, and their relatives. But um, more so than just the anatomy, I try and place those animals into their environmental context or really their ecological context. So I work actually a number of the people who are sitting right over next to you here. I work very closely with them. Some are faculty, some are students. And we go into different parts of the world, uh, Madagascar, Tanzania, Antarctica, to try and understand these past ecosystems. So that's maybe longer than I needed to, but that's, that's, that's what my focus is. And, and you know, Dr. Hembry has uh, a similar kind of large-scale uh, goal in his research. He tends to focus more on the geological side or really the interface between the geology and the biology, looking at trace fossils and, you know, things that animals and uh, wh what traces they leave in the rock record. Uh, is, that, is that fair? Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the question was, uh, were the, the Dimetrodons that were depicted in the film, are they in some way reflective of reality? Is that your question? Well, um, that's a great question. Those were clearly lizards um, <laughs> that ha had been modified for a purpose. Um, so no uh, to answer your question. But, you know, I, I, think, I think part of this film, we have to think about when it was made, what they had available, and what some of the larger concepts they were trying to, to get at here. I mean, we, there are lots of things about this film that, you know, I think were cringeworthy. And, um, <laughs> but, but the, you know, once again, if you kind of put your head back into that space of what was the message. And keep in mind, this film was made in the late 50s, but it's based on a book from 1859, 58. Yeah, so, I don't know. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting in the in the book, most of this has not happened. <laughs> there's no Gertrude, unfortunately, in the book. There's no Gertrude, <laughs> and they actually come across um, marine reptiles in the movie, uh, in the in the book. So there's there's this sea at the center of the earth, and they encounter plesiosaurs, and they're what actually was attacked in the, in the novel. So it's kind of interesting changes to that, which I guess is easier to modify. <laughs> modify an animal with a sail than to make it please us And then there is a, a more recent version of this I personally haven't seen, but I, I know enough that that one they actually involved dinosaurs is, is at least part of that story. Who, who's, who's actually seen the, Liz has seen the recent one? They do have dinosaurs in it. Yeah. yeah. Are they anatomically correct? They are. <laughs> <laughs> They're not lizards with strapped to them. Okay. <laughs> Does it have a, the same title? Yes. Does a remake movie have the same title? It was with Brendan Fraser. Yeah, I think it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. I'm yeah. quite sure it does. Never heard of it. It's probably, what, six years ago or so? Yeah. Uh, yes? So the center of the earth, and, and the, uh, in the movie, they had it as a lake, right? So it was that the theory at the time? And, and I, I assumed, or I, the center of the earth is supposed to be some sort of molten liquid right well the, the the center of the earth is actually it's it's a solid so it's a solid nickel iron core and that's surrounded by a liquid so a liquid outer core around it which is also primarily iron and nickel um, at the time that the the book was written nobody had any idea yeah. as to what was below the surface um, so this is all mainly guesswork by Jules Verne um, as far as what anybody would find if they actually were able to travel into the, into the earth. Um, uh, as far as being able to actually go there, that's pretty much unlikely to ever happen. It's, it's 6,000 6, kilometers to the center of the earth. 
Uh, the deepest well that's been dug is about 12 kilometers, and that was in Russia. Um, and that was between 1970s and 1990s. Um, over that span of time, they were able to drill 12 kilometers. So and that basically gets, it barely scratches the surface of the continents. So continental crust will get down to about 100 kilometers. If you go out to the ocean floor, the oceanic crust is between 7 and 10 kilometers. So that's pretty thin. Uh, but those rocks are also incredibly dense and will be very difficult to actually drill through. Um, so the prospect of being able to travel, as they were saying in the movie, they're traveling hundreds of kilometers just by walking into the earth is, is an interesting way of, of thinking of doing it. Um, but again, that's from the perspective of the, the 19th century futurists, basically. There are lots of, of organisms that have bioluminescence, and there are, uh, if you go into caves, there are lots of, of, of uh, various types of microorganisms that actually will, that live there, that coat the walls, uh, that live in areas where there is water seeping through. Um, as far as any of the bioluminescence, I, I actually don't know. Yeah, there actually was, uh, uh, with, were some miners trapped, and I don't remember which country, where they were without power, but they could see because of the uh, luminescence. That was a story back from the 60s, I recall. Mm -hmm. um, well, right now I'm working on uh, continuing with my work with these ancient soils. So the Bolivia project I talked about is, is currently ongoing. Um, and a lot of my work also involves studying modern organisms, studying modern soil environments. So this coming summer I'll be out in the Sonoran Desert studying uh, desert soils and desert organisms and using uh, the modern systems to try to interpret ancient uh, desert soils and look at the interaction between the organisms and the soils and to see how the organisms are, are affecting soil development through time. Um, so, you know, much of my current work is that link between the modern and the ancient and trying to use the modern earth as kind of a as a natural laboratory for understanding uh, the past earth. What is our take on, on women in science? Um, well, obviously women have an, an important role in science. And you saw many of the pictures I showed in, the, in my talk. And most of the people involved in the projects I've been with have been women. Um, what's in, interesting in the film is you know we, we watched this ahead of time. and. Um, yeah, there are a lot of interesting comments being made by the crotchety old guy. Um, kind of the classic old, old man in science. Um, so yeah, the field has definitely changed. Uh, obviously since the 19th century, which is when this is supposed to be taking place. Literally since the 50s and 60s. Um, but what's interesting is even in this film, um, the kind of poking fun at that kind of a sentiment. Because it's, he's always making these comments about her being a woman but the people who are constantly messing up are the two guys you know, constantly <laughs> getting them into the most trouble. Do um, you have more to offer on that? No, I mean, I would agree that, uh, that uh, clearly I think uh, the you know, society in general has moved a, a long way uh, since the time of this, uh, when it was set, obviously, not to mention when the film was made. Uh, so I, I have many uh, collaborators in particular, the person who just asked that question is my primary <laughs> collaborator um, in science. So uh, I think uh, for the other people in the audience who don't know that, but that's it's a very good question. What role is there? But yeah, there, there's every opportunity there for for you, regardless of what your gender is. I think. Actually, it's a very that's a difficult question to. to Sorry. To, no, it's a great question. Um, I don't know, there's been, uh, I don't know, do you want to go first? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I can think of specific instances of, uh, so, you know, sometimes in the field when you, uh, you know, you, you come around a corner and you happen to just see a little bit of bone starting to erode out of uh, a bit of sandstone. And in some of the places I work, most of the time that might end up being just a little piece of a little fragment of a bone. But every once in a while, that little fragment of a bone turns into a 
skeleton or a partial skeleton. I mean, so there are those kinds of, you know, when you're in the field and you're, you know, or, I, know, I mean, quite honestly, um, as much as I'm there to do the biology and the paleontology, I take great satisfaction out of um, non-science parts of it that's working as parts of, uh, as a member of a big team that's intersecting with um, people from all over the planet so there's, there are all kinds of cultural, you know, kind of interactions and exchange opportunities. Um, and, and in my opinion, that's, that's up there, you know, at the top for me um, with the science part of it, so. But. Yeah, I mean, I agree that kind of the collaboration in the field is probably one of the best parts when you're working with a large number of people. But there's also that moment where you kind of, things start to come together and you, you collect the data to the point where you know the, the picture starts to become clear, and, and you kind of start seeing the answer to the question that you're out there trying to solve. And that's really kind of the, the best part of it. It's, it's a lot of it's a lot of work, a lot of struggle to get to that point. But yeah. as far as specific moments, though, yeah, the parts of pictures that kind of stand out are usually um, the non-scientific ones, as Pat was saying. Uh, Alaska, having a caribou running at me, that was probably a memorable experience. But, um, yeah, it's kind of things coming together, kind of the, the final phase of the project. I think uh, creatives exist in all fields, and I, I mean, many of the scientists I know are also some of the most artistic people I know. Um, so I think, I think a creative mind can really find a, a great way to succeed and be, you know, to move ahead in, in science or in art. The, personally, the one thing that I work on, Nancy works on this, and I'm sure Dan encounters this in his own field, is that sometimes um, when we're communicating science, like I can communicate to Dan about some detailed bump on a bone in a dinosaur or something, and that might be great for Dan, but we also have this, uh, I don't know, it's a responsibility or it's just, it's part of what we do and that's, that's to be able to, to really connect out with people who are not scientists. And so I work with a number of artists, uh, you know, so, sometimes scientific illustration, but sometimes people who are more, you know, graphics related to, to help paint that <laughs> ecosystem, you know, put that whole ecosystem in place. And so in recent years, I've, I've really kind of seen a, a great way that these things are coming together and can really intermingle to uh, effectively communicate, you know, to a, a much broader audience. So I think that's one of the very practical ways I see them interfacing now. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thanks a lot. Thank you.